All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us for the third panel of the day, um, Public Confidence and the Propensity to Serve. Um, for those of you uh, grad students and undergrad students here in the room, I want you to know that we have a living literature review right here <laughs> on the stage with us. Um, so my name is Kate Kuzminski. I am a senior fellow and the director of the Military Veterans and Society Program at the Center for New American Security where I focus on military personnel policy um, and broader submill issues. Um, I'm joined today by Dr. Peter Fever, uh, who needs no introduction, but uh, joins us from Duke University. Also joined today by Dr. Ron Krebs from the University of Minnesota. And lastly, uh, joined by Dr. Meredith Claycamp uh, from the University of Maryland. Um, so to, to frame the conversation that we're going to have today, um, so we're thinking about public confidence in the military, but also um, an issue that we all see in the news quite a bit right now, which is the propensity to serve and the impact on military recruitment. Um, when we think about propensity to serve, or when we think about military service, there's two requirements. One is that an individual meets the eligibility requirement. Um, depending on who you, whose data you use, that's between 17 and 30% of American youth right now. Um, and that's been fairly consistent over the last 20, 30 years. Um, but the other element that's required is that they have a propensity to serve. They're actually interested in military service um, and or open to being recruited. Uh, you've heard Dr. Fever reference today. It's not just the all-volunteer force. It's all, the all-recruited force. There's some effort that, that goes into that equation. Um, and when we look at the propensity to serve among American youth right now, it's at 9%. Um, mind you, there has to be an overlap in that Venn diagram. So there are some who are interested in potentially serving in the military who fundamentally end up not being eligible to serve. Um, so it's a very small proportion of the population that we're looking at. Um, so an, another thing uh, worth considering is um, we, we look at the uh, data regarding propensity to serve that comes uh, from in, within the Department of the Defense, uh, the, the uh, Joint Advertising and Marketing uh, uh, System, um, or JAMMERS. Um, and uh, we see some trends over time. But one of the more interesting facts that we've seen is that depending on the year, uh, you might have a high percentage of individuals who end up serving in the military who, and when they were initially asked um, as a youth, said they weren't interested in military service. So that's actually a credit to um, the profession of, of military recruitment. Um, over the last couple of years, and, and certainly this has been true throughout American history, the, the military itself has become politicized, and we've talked about that a lot today, but that does a lot for public perceptions and trust and faith in the military. Um, we, in, in recent weeks uh, and, and in the last year, we've certainly seen a lot of um, politicization from, from one side of the aisle looking at issues of wokeness in the military, um, as we've referenced a couple of times. But I think it's worth looking at some of the structural things um, that we have seen um, just recently. So uh, about two weeks ago, it was announced that the House Armed Services Committee is standing up a high-level panel to discuss quality of life issues among the force, including the recruitment challenge, um, uh, quality of life with respect to the condition of barracks or military family food insecurity. And what stood out to me on that is we already have a subcommittee on the House Armed Services Committee that is responsible for that oversight. Um, but if you look at the calendar of hearings that, that's coming up, um, the focus is entirely on um, whether or not or how bad um, the state of diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings are in the military, um, which demonstrates that there's been an abdication from political elites and particularly from those in Congress who, who bear that responsibility. Um, also interesting to see uh, there are members of Congress who are running for Senate um, who are using as part of their platform in their state uh, the fact that they're going to fight wokeism in the military. Um, and I'm not entirely sure who the constituency is at us in a state election uh, about fighting wokeism in the military. So it's certainly become more of a political football um, within uh, the, the political 
uh, wings of, of governance. Um, but we also have to take into consideration some generational dynamics. Um, so not only do we have this rising generation, uh, Gen Z, um, I like to remind people, I think a lot of times we refer to millennials as being military recruits. Turns out millennials are now in middle management uh, and <laughs> Gen Z are between the ages of roughly 10 and 27. So that recruited population who have different interests, but their parents also have uh, very different perceptions of military service than, than and pre previous generations. So um, we see um, in, in some work I did when I was uh, at the RAND Corporation, uh, we interviewed a number of recruiters and they continuously said that one of the biggest challenges was a lot of parents were the first in their generation or first in their family to go to college, first in their family to reach the middle class. And now it was an expectation that they provide that opportunity for their children. So this expectation that you go straight from high school to college has been a real challenge for um, military recruiters. Um, we also see uh, among veterans that, so we've, we've addressed a couple times today, the kind of warrior cast or the um, number of individuals who serve in the military because they have a familial connection. We see in recent uh, polling that veterans are less likely to recommend military service to their uh, family members. And if we're gaining a large proportion of, of service members from those communities, the fact that it's being dissuaded is, is a challenge. Um, so uh, we've got a tall order today, kind of thinking about this perception of military service and how that might affect uh, propensity to serve now and in the future. Um, and so with that, I'm uh, going to turn it over first to, to Peter to talk about this um, perceptions of military service. So you have a new book coming out. We uh, are, are happy to plug it and, and looking Me forward too. to reading it. Um, it called aptly, thank, thank you for your service, thanks for your service. Thanks for your service. Thanks for your service. Um, which highlights trends regarding public confidence in the military, um, how that has changed or stayed consistent over time. So can you speak a bit to or characterize what your research has found? Yes, so thank you for that and thank you for the, the kind introduction you gave, which would have been kinder if you hadn't put the emphasis on living. It's still <laughs> living. You made it sound like it was surprising yeah, uh, that I was still alive. alive. Yeah. <laughs> still barely alive. Um, actually, I'm going to do a literature review to answer your question, because in the late 1990s, I, there was a civil military gap project that um, I helped lead with Dick Cohn. And as part of that, I partnered with another political scientist to do a a deep dive on public confidence in the military at that time. And we had noted that the, the spike in approval, confidence in the military after Desert Storm, when it reached you know, really very high levels, had dropped gradually over the course of the decade. And so we were doing a deep dive in 1998 onto what's, what are drivers of public confidence and you know, what w might we find. And we concluded that expressions of high confidence in the military at that time masked underlying potential alienation and, and that the confidence was uh, uncertain, quote unquote uncertain, and even brittle. And you know we thought it was likely to drop over time. And you can pinpoint the publication of that article because if you get a graph of public confidence in the military over time, right after we published that, confidence in the military climbed and confidence in all the other institutions dropped. And so the gap, which was, this wide in the 90s became that wide in the aughts and, and later on. So 20 years later, I said, I should find out why I was wrong. You know, rarely has an academic so proven so wrong so quickly. Uh, but five years ago, I set out with my research partner, Jim Golby, to look at this question, why was I wrong? And Jim was an excellent person to partner with because he had made a career out of showing why I was wrong in other areas. And so he was great. We collected the richest, and I think is still the most systematic data on public confidence in the military. What are the drivers? What are the correlates of it? And the fruits, thank you for plugging it, will be published uh, in May in, by Oxford University Press. And it's thanks for your service, the causes and consequences of public confidence. And what Jim and I found and what I'll publish in May uh, will sound eerily like I haven't learned a thing in 25 years because the, co the lo bottom lines are this, that public confidence in the military is high but hollow. So 
it, and I can thank one of my students for coming up with that, that phrasing. He, he was in my class, he read, he said, yeah, you're, what you're saying is it's high but hollow, and I love it, so I'm gonna steal it. Um, it's high, but it's propped up by things other than deservedness, than the pure deservedness. It's propped up by things like social desirability bias. So you know the, the, um, the Curb Your Enthusiasm uh, episode where uh, there's a, someone brings their date, their date's in the army, and they all go around the room, thanks for your service, thanks for your service, and, until you get to uh, the lead, and he, he says, hey, how are you? you know, and everyone is shocked that you didn't say thanks for your service, and the whole ruins the whole thing. That's social desirability bias, when it's, you feel like you have to say it, and, and I think expressing high confidence in the military is something that everyone knows, well, everybody else is expressing high confidence in the military, I should be expressing high confidence. When you use survey techniques that are meant to uncover what the latent attitude is rather than what the biased added, uh, expression might be, uh, you get a drop of, depending on the measure, nine to 20 plus points. So there, that there's some fraction of public confidence in the military that's just political correctness. Uh, there's also partisan identification. It, the public confidence of the military climbed in those post 9-11 years uh, to reach almost a identification between the Republican Party and the military, that Republicans had extremely high levels of public confidence, uh, whereas Democrats had just moderately high levels. Um, and then there's something else that's at work, which is a, like a partisan blame game, uh, where the public will be asked, you know, how do you think, uh, who, who do you think should be blamed for the situation in Afghanistan? Uh, this is before the pullout of Afghanistan, so this is in 2020. Things aren't great. How, who should be blamed for it? And the public will say, civilian leaders of the other party messed up. The civilian leaders of my party and the military did okay. Uh, so Democrats will blame Republican civilian leaders, but not the military or Democratic leaders. Republican respondents blame Democratic leaders, but not Republican leaders or the military. And this allows the military to sort of avoid accountability uh, by hiding behind the partisan shell game. Then uh, the other traditional props of uh, public confidence uh, may be eroding. So. Uh, just as just a demographic, personal contact with the military is is dropping. People, families, members who served as the World War II generation has largely passed, uh, now passing is the draft generation, and gradually what will be left are is the much much smaller all volunteer force. So there's just fewer people in the American public who you could have had contact with as a family member or as a uh, as a loved one or yourself having served. Well, public confidence in the military is correlated with all those things. If you've served, you have higher confidence. If your family member served, you have higher confidence, et cetera. And so the, those demographic um, props are dropping. War footing. It's one of the key things that, that we got wrong in 1998 is we didn't anticipate 9-11. We weren't the only ones, but we, 9-11 uh, produce, put us on to a semi-permanent war footing for a couple decades. And I think the public viewed the military in the post, for those uh, decade or two afterwards, as we're in wartime. And that's a different m frame of reference with respect to the military. We have not been in wartime. Now, did Putin change things? W uh, unclear. Um, we we'll have to do more funding, and I mean more research, which means more funding. But, but if we don't return to a, a war footing, then you would expect public confidence to go back to historic uh, levels, which are lower. What about the perception of competence? Can we judge the military to be as competent today as we were willing to do uh, early on? Early on, maybe not. And then. Crucially, the unqualified support of Republican leaders. So I, I do think this is a more significant change that the, that the Republican political leadership, uh, you know, seeing, to include the president, President Trump, uh, running for re-election in, in September 2020, sort of taking shots at the senior military leaders, but also uh, Republican media figures who are very prominent taking shots at the military. And this is the most important 
result, I think, that the Reagan of poll uh, has found. What they show is that partisan attacks of the military have resonated with the public. So when in their poll, watchers of NBC, MSNBC say, I'm concerned about extreme right wingers in the military. Watchers of Fox say, I'm concerned about woke in the military. Uh, and Republicans as a whole have dropped somewhat. The, the 2022 poll shows that public support has actually gone up, including among Republicans, of what it had been in 21. So it's not quite the doom and gloom uh, that some of the earlier uh, comments today might have suggested. But it definitely shows that partisan attacks are being ref uh, felt in the public and I think reflected in public views. So why should we care about it? Well, public uh, confidence shores up other things that we care about, like recruiting, shores up spending for defense. It's not unproblematic, and I'm going to leave my friend Ron to able to explain the other side of the coin, which I agree is needs to be said. I'll let him say it. Uh, but I would rather have high public confidence that's deserved than low public confidence that's deserved. So I think the, the sweet spot here is confidence in the military that's deserved. That means it's driven by assessments of professional competence, assessments of high ethical standards, and assessment that the military is out of the partisan game and as staying out there. That would be deservedness. And then public confidence in the other institutions rising. I can go deeper on all of this. Uh, but why don't I stop there and give my panelists a chance? Yeah, so uh, that's that's a great segue to to Ron's research. So we, you know, when we hear that public confidence in the military is dropping, uh, we think that's a bad thing. And then we, we think that um, growth in confidence in any institution might be an unalloyed good. But there's more nuance to it than that. Um, and I think your research really hits on that. Um, so um, thinking through. Um, you know, what your work highlights. Can you speak to the nuance between the, this, how do we balance uh, excessive trust that's undeserved um, and maybe also excessive distrust? Yeah. So we haven't spoken a lot about one word that I think is really important in all this, and that is deference. We've spoken uh, a lot about some of the, Peter spoke a lot about the ways in which trust in the military is hollow. I absolutely agree. But one of the things that gets associated with trust in the military has to do with deference to the military. Deference meaning that you believe that civilian officials should replace their judgment with that of military officers. And what we've discovered is that pu the public basically doesn't believe in the basic premises of democratic civil military relations. At a very basic, at a very core level, that notion that every school child knows that democracy is government of the people, by the people, and for the people means that the will of the people as expressed through their elective representatives should reign supreme. But the public doesn't seem to believe in it. We have, um, in the surveys that we've conducted, we found that something like 50% of the public basically believes that regardless of whether the president thinks that uh, you uh, should or should not conduct a military operation, if the military is opposed, they should defer to the judgment of the military. Peter led a project, as he alluded to, back now over 20 years ago, that oddly, no one, including Peter, followed up on right, to do that again. So we said, well, let's try to do that. And lo and behold, the problem has gotten worse over the last 20 years. And on the face of it, one of the seeming predictors of this, one of the things that's associated with it, is trust in the military. But then we dug a little deeper. Right? So that's the, the drawback of, even if that trust is hollow, the drawback is, well, it seems like it seems to conduce to deference. And of course, that makes sense. If the essence of trust is a set of associated beliefs that the military is uniquely competent, that they're uniquely competent, as some studies have shown, beyond their area of military expertise, and that they're also uniquely patriotic, as opposed to, if you will, venal politicians, right? then lo and behold, sure, you should be deferential to them. But then we found something really pretty surprising, what struck as puzzling at the time. Those who most distrusted the armed forces in 2019 were also most deferential to senior officers. And those who were, conversely, who most trusted the armed forces were the least deferential. And we sat there and we noodled over this for a while. 
And we realized that trust in the military had been trumped. And it had been trumped by how people felt about Trump. Right. right? That it was entirely a product of politics. That if you were someone who most distrusted the military, you were more likely to be on the left. And that meant you didn't trust the military very much, but you distrusted Donald Trump even more. And the latter, right, Democrats, right, uh, excuse me, Republicans, those who most trusted the armed forces, wanted their man in the Oval Office to have a free hand. So trust in the military matters, but we discovered that lo and behold, it doesn't matter as much as we thought that it did. That in fact, that it was trumped by politics. So we then predicted when Joe Biden won the White House, there'd be a snapback. And lo and behold, that didn't quite happen. It happened amongst Democrats, but it didn't happen amongst Republicans. Turned out the Republicans, we thought they'd be a lot more deferential, bind Biden, if you will. But lo and behold, they actually were only slightly more deferential to the military because thanks to the denigration of the military beginning with uh, the summer of 2020, begin and then continue with Mark Milley crossing Lafayette Square and then apologizing for so doing, continuing as the election of 2020 heated up when Donald Trump put the military in the crosshairs and essentially accused senior officers of being corrupt in September of 2020 in an infamous uh, news conference. And then in the summer of 2021, when a bevy of pundits and politicians on the right put the woke military in the crosshairs, the effect was that Republicans and Democrats, Republicans said, this is, they're not really on our side. And lo and behold, Democrats said, they probably are on our side. And that would maybe even more dangerous then, I would venture to say, than venerating the military, which I think is a serious concern, is politicization of the military in another sense. People have used the expression sword and shield. I'm gonna say prop and punching bag. When the military is used as a political prop and it's a political punching bag, they have in a certain way the same effect, which is that it invites people to think of the military in our politicized environment the way we think of anybody else in that, political, in that politicized environment, which is they are an adversary or they are an ally, one or the other. Uh, and the result was that not only were Democrats therefore much less likely to be deferential to the military and Republicans were only slightly more deferential. But lo and behold, and this was really striking, Democrats in 2021 said to them, basically, military is on our side. Yes, we want you to advocate publicly for policies uh, that uh, both in the military affairs and not in military affairs. And Republicans said, you're the enemy. We don't think that you share our political preferences. So please stay on the sidelines. And that maybe is what is uh, the greatest sort of danger of all of this, that on the one hand, we might say veneration is bad and denigration is bad, that we name for that Aristotelian middle. But the answer is probably something that both denigration and veneration are problematic together in that they invite us to think of the military as either adversary or enemy. And that's not very good for, uh, for democracy. That's not very good for policy. It's not very good for national security policy. And uh, in the theme of this panel, it's also something that potentially can harm recruitment. I don't think we're seeing it yet because this is coming exactly at a moment when the job market is unprecedentedly tight. So we're going to expect the military to have difficulty recruiting regardless. But it is something that I think that we need to think about and worry about moving forward. So uh, I guess a, a follow-up question to you on that would be, what are we as Americans to do with that? whether on the military leadership side or on the civilian side? Yeah, I think a lot, of the, um, a lot of the recommendations that would occur to me, I think, are things that have come up before. And so I don't want to beat the sort of a broken record. Um, things like lifelong civics education, right? No one here is going to disagree with that. Things like restore the military's apolitical standing. And there is more for everyone to do on that score. I want to highlight just two things that I think make this a little bit more complicated. One is, what does it mean and how do you go about restoring a political standing in an environment where everything is understood to be politicized? Where there is no, if there was ever a distinction between policy and politics, and there really isn't, go back to James Forrestal in the 1940s, I can no more divorce policy from politics than I can divorce sex from procreation, he said. Right? How can you offer policy guidance in an environment where everything is politicized. But I, I want to sort of tee up a sort of a different, con another conversation, which is what is that alternative look like? How should we talk about 
military service in an environment where we are, uh, where we're concerned about veneration and romanticization of military service. One answer that we've already begun to talk about a little bit today, but I think is really pushing up against much larger political headwinds, is to push back against um, a larger, small L liberal political culture that has been all about rights and not about obligations. That's all about the individual and not about a sense of community. But that's pushing, I'm sympathetic to that. I think some of us in this room might be. But that's pushing against real political headwinds. So the alternative is, and I want to throw out there, is to speak about, uh, more honestly, about the diversity of motives that go into military service. That military service is uh, dangerous work, but it is indeed work. Um, we can thank people for their service, but thank them for their democratic service. Thank them, what we need is respect, and with respect comes critical engagement, not veneration. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna move down, down the panel to, to Meredith. Um, so Meredith is a uh, military sociologist um, and has done some incredible work on such a wide range of topics that I actually had to like figure out which ones to prioritize. Um, so uh, you've researched a, a wide range, range of perceptions of military service and of veterans, of returning veterans. Can you talk us through your work on the perception or the reception of veterans back in communities and how that both affects and maybe reflects um, public confidence in military service? Sure, um, another word for um, your description of my CV might be dilettante, so um, I appreciate your generous, um, your generous message on that. Um, so I've done a, a bit of work, um, as Kate said, on thinking about kind of um, how veterans return to life. My interest in this topic was really born as a sociologist interested in inequality and asking whether the military served as a source um, of opportunity for certain kinds of Americans to advance their lives, right? In particular, racial minorities at the time. Um, I remember starting this work in 1998 where you had to convince somebody looking at the military might be an interesting thing to do. Um, you know, it was a very different world. Um, and I also was going to graduate school at a time, if there's an economist, I know there's one in the room at least, uh, the, the beginning of kind of the credibility revolution, right? Thinking about causal analysis and causal effects um, in the orbit of my graduate training. And so what I was really interested in, invested in, was how does military service affect people's lives after they serve? Um, one way that I tried to answer that question, and it, it may not sound like it's about perception of veterans, but it's about the behavioral response to perception of veterans. Um, so one way I got at that was to conduct what are called audit studies. If you've ever read Freakonomics or listened to anything about Freakonomics, you might be familiar with, with this method, which is essentially um, having fake jobs job applicants apply to real jobs and varying some characteristic of interest to see how they're treated, right? And the, the people are, what this is meant to do is to um, avert the problem of bias, um, socially desirable responding. And so after doing um, two different audit studies that varied a whole bunch of things, but the, you know, the general premise is you take two or maybe three, in one case, um, job seekers who are all fake, they are comparable in every way, but the thing that you are experimentally interested in, and in my case, what I was interested in was um, how people would treat a veteran job seeker in comparison to a comparable civilian. Um, this is at a time when we were beginning the war. There was a lot of concern, a lot of anecdotal evidence um, from veterans who were returning trying to find work who said, I can't find a job. You know, civilian, civilian employers think I'm crazy, they don't want to hire me, and sort of these individual narratives of discrimination when they weren't finding work. Well, um, to make, you know, a, a short story less long, um, the evidence is exactly the opposite. In across two audit studies in New York City and Kansas City, two very different kinds of climates, um, veteran applicants were um, systematically called back for job interviews more frequently than their comparable civilian counterpart. Um, the only exception to that, I would say the worst case scenario was that veterans were treated equally to a matched um, job seeker um, at worst. 
Uh, at best, they were treated preferentially. They were sort of positively discriminated for as opposed to negatively discriminated against. And the one exception to that was um, in sort of a team, right? I'm talking about these as if they're real people, but a team where um, two black job seekers, male job seekers, um, were paired together. The veteran had been um, in combat arms, had been a tanker in you know, the resume that was sent. And um, that person was, was pitted against a civilian who had, there's not really comparable job experience, right? Um, in that particular case, a black veteran who had combat arms experience received no calls, calls back for an interview in response to 120 job applications. So that was the one singular example where um, they were not statistically treated equivalently. Um, so I conducted that. I, I felt like, OK, any narrative that veterans are sort of negatively thought of or, or at least um, treated in the labor market, I didn't buy. But you know, there's more outcomes in life that veterans are very sensitive to um, in, their, in their return to civilian life. And employment and getting a job is just one. There's all kinds of um, micro level social interactions that everybody has on a daily basis that we infer something about our position, right? Social position. Um, on the basis of our treatment in these individual interactions. Um, so with a colleague, we set out um, to conduct another experiment, this time through a survey, where um, we, we characterized a short little story, a short little vignette, um, and we varied a number of characteristics about the, the person that was in this vignette, and then we asked how people would respond to them. So the vignette went something like this. John is a, and I'll give you one of the treatments. John is a um, recently, um, separated veteran of the war in Iraq. Um, while he served, his unit came under fire. He's now out of the military and is looking for a job and a place to live. And then it's a very short, not much cue to go on. We varied whether John was described as a military veteran or a contractor, right? That was our closest civilian comparison. We varied whether John was described as having um, served or worked in Iraq and come under fire, whether he was deployed or worked in Iraq with no comment about the conditions of that experience, and whether um, he worked domestically. Um, so we were kind of trying to capture this element of service, right, in terms of working for the military or working for profit, right, for a contractor, doing something similar. So, so the service element and then the sacrifice element, which would come in the form of, you know, dangerous, experience of dangerous conditions. And then we asked people to tell us um, sort of three buckets of things. One was um, whether they were concerned at all whether John might have a problem with substance use or abuse, whether they'd be surprised to learn that John had been recently accused of assault, and whether, uh, let's see, um, whether uh, they'd be surprised to learn that John was being treated for a mental health problem, right? So getting at this, the concern that veterans are stigmatized as problematic individuals, right? The victims um, in our victim hero binary that we talk about. We asked whether, um, because John was described as looking for a job, should he um, get assistance from the government in finding work? And were he um, in competition for a position with um, someone who's equally qualified, but who's not a veteran, should he be preferred for hire? Um, and then we asked three questions that were related to social distance, Bogardus's social distance scale. So we asked, how glad would you be to have John as a friend, neighbor, and coworker? And so you can mentally come up with your own hypotheses about what you think might happen here. Um, and in fact, people were not surprised that John, the combat exposed veteran, might have some of these problems, right? Um, he was the, that was the highest sort of, um, highest one of our, our experimental conditions to elicit the idea of having problems, right? Um, the combat veteran was also the person who was deemed uh, most uh, deserving of government assistance and preferential treatment. Surprisingly, um, the combat exposed veteran was also the person who elicited the greatest desire for social relationships. John, the combat exposed veteran, who's, who you're least likely to be surprised has a, a, a charge of assault, 
a mental health challenge and maybe a substance use problem, that's also who you were most likely to want to have as your friend, neighbor, and coworker. And people only saw one, you know, they only saw one description. So they didn't necessarily know, you know, who we were, what was being compared. Um, when we control for the idea that social psychology tells us people that we think have problems like substance use and mental health problems are not usually people we want to engage in social relationships with, when we controlled for that, the desire for interaction with John was even higher, right? Um, and so we, so I, my colleague and I couldn't believe that. Right. On the one hand, it reinforced the behavioral response from the audit studies that said people really are pause, have expressed a great deal of positive sentiment about veterans, right? About those who have served in the military on these different domains. But we didn't believe it, so we went and conducted um, something similar to what Peter was describing, um, a list experiment to try to capture, you know, people are just lying. I mean, our first reaction and those of our reviewers of the paper were, you know, people are just lying. That's socially desirable reporting. And we conducted a kind of follow-up study, and, you know, I won't go into the details, but Essentially, we, we tried to elicit um, people's sort of true reaction to questions about um, should more of your tax dollars go to support um, health care for veterans, right? So I'm not even asking if you want to pay more taxes. Nobody wants to pay more taxes. That's a loaded question. But given the taxes you already pay, should they be reallocated to veterans' health care? Um, and uh, what else did we ask? There's another social distance question. But essentially, people weren't lying about that question of wanting to have a genuine social connection with a veteran. Where they do overstate their views, where they lie, if you will, is about um, willingness to pay for health care, right? And that fell, um, the, the extent of overstatement of willingness to support policies for veterans' health care um, came most from Republicans. Um, and and least from Democrats. So um, that's a law. That's a you know. I'm happy to send you the links to the papers. Uh, <laughs> but but all of that is to say that um, I went into this you know originally because I thought the public might like. I listened to veterans who said they felt mistreated. They felt you know metaphorically spat upon. You know in this generation they felt like they were side eyed. That they were disadvantaged. And um, so I went in sort of with the hypothesis that, yeah, that maybe that's going on. And at every attempt to sort of confirm that anecdote that I heard from veterans, I was instead confronted with empirical evidence of pretty systematic and widespread positive public sentiment um, accorded to veterans. And I think it's important to make the distinction that the military as an institution and veterans as, veterans I think are seen as individual people, right, who have passed through the institution. Whereas when we talk about, you know, sentiment about the military, it's hard, harder for me to understand how the public thinks about what that means. Do they mean the troops? Do they mean flag officers? Or do they mean some broader institutional arrangement that is sort of less about individual people and more about the organization. So military recruits are part of the broader public, um, and you've spent a fair bit of time researching um, demographic change and perceptions of pre-enlistment recruits on, on these issues. Have these perceptions changed over time? Um, and what might that tell us about broader societal trends and or the community of people who have a propensity to serve in the military? Yeah, I, my, my lock screen came on and I have like a 200 character password requirement from my university. So um, apologies, I was hoping to at least be uh, you know, consistent with my numbers, but I don't think this lovely picture of um, Tahiti is going to help, help me. Um, yeah, so, so recently I've been um, using the Monitoring the Future data. I think, Peter, you might, were you all using that for your book as well? So Monitoring the Future is um, an ongoing cross-section of youth in the United States that began collecting data around 1976, I believe. It captures data from an eighth grade sample, a 10th grade sample, a 12th grade sample, and a subsample of those 12th graders are followed long longitudinally every other year, I believe, until like they're age 30 or something. It's really a, a completely, in many ways, overlooked um, source of data. And um, so, 
I set out to try to um, look at the, to try to dig a little bit deeper about a recent paper that came out from Natetta and Tarsi that basically concluded um, that veterans of the all-volunteer force showed some of um, the least racially um, equitable attitudes. They had some of the most negative views of black Americans um, compared to any other uh, generation of veterans. And I thought this was sort of, this. I was reading this paper around the time of like, our concerns about white nationalism in the ranks and um, just our general um, national reckoning with race. And, and so this paper has this stark finding and is unable to really say much about whether that is a selection effect or a treatment effect, right? So in an all-volunteer force, those who join are those who want to join, right? Um, they, they choose voluntarily to do so. Um, so the question is, to my mind, that felt really important to answer was, are people who are propense to join the military more likely to be racist um, than those who don't want to serve in the military? Or was this finding about veterans of the all-volunteer force about something about the nature of the military experience in the all-volunteer force, like a treatment effect, right? Something about that made you hold uh, more, um, less hospitable views about race. And so I used monitoring the future, and in fact, um, so I won't use, uh, I won't use the, the W word, uh, but in fact, young people over time have become much more racially inclusive in their attitudes. They are more accepting, more desiring of racial integration. They are less tolerant of um, and less supportive of ideas about racial segregation. They also, however, have become a bit more, um, they've, they've held a little more antipathy towards ideas about race. While, right, we believe that it's important to have racial integration and we shouldn't be racially segregating, there's also an increase towards ideas that, you know, especially for whites, race is sort of not any of my concern. Um, which is also a, maybe a problematic idea. And um, so of those who are propense to serve in the military, the trends are that attitudes towards race are becoming more equitable, just like attitudes among those who aren't propensed. However, the gap between those who are, who are interested and inclined towards joining the military, that gap has grown wider, meaning um, you know, they hold less racially equitable views than their civilian counterparts. Um, and I think as we think about having a recruiting crisis and we think about the weaponization of a term like woke, um, you know, Corey Shockey sort of stole the point that I wanted to make, so I'll just say it again for anyone who wasn't here during their session. Um, there's a lot of attention paid towards concern about who's no longer interested or inclined towards serving in the military, who no longer wants to join because of concerns around diversity, equity, and inclusion policies. Um, I am much, much, much more concerned um, by the fact that the people who have, increasingly the people who are propense to join the military, military look less and less like their civilian counterparts on questions about racial equity and inclusion. And I personally um, would, would hope that um, we think about why the military isn't attractive to people who um, believe in racial equity, why it's less attractive to people, people who believe in racial equity than to people who have, hold less hospitable views on that. So I'll um, ask one more question down the panel and then uh, we'll invite your questions. So a reminder, um, we'll have folks line up at the microphones and then um, please state your name and your organization and then your question. Um, so thinking about the, the what next or what to do question, um, again, operating in this environment where 
we do face challenges in military recruitment, some that are within the military's control, some that are without. What are military leaders to do with the findings of your individual research, and what are civilian leaders to do with that? So Peter, we'll turn it to you. So I have two takeaways. One is that they should focus on, if they should be concerned about public confidence in the military. Don't need to persuade them on that. They are concerned about it. Mm -hmm. They know the polling numbers. They track it. Uh, they're right to be concerned about it, but they should be focused on deservedness rather than the other props, because some of the, the demographic props and things they can't do anything about. But they can focus on deservedness, and so it's kind of a stick to your lane, focus on professionalism, restore the profession, uh, restore, restore or shore up the professional norms, et cetera, et cetera, focus on that and the rest may follow. That's the first pillar. The second pillar, though, is that they should be uh, concerned about pedestalization. That's, how, that's my awkward word for uh, Ron's better word, deference. This is the idea that you're put on a pedestal, and then, of course, if you're on a pedestal, you're looking down on everybody else, right? So that that's not a good place for the military to be. But the way to do that, uh, the, the the way to respond to that is not to get down in the muck and you know then be undeserved, is, is to focus on ennobling the rest of it. So I had an idea for a thanks for your service, public service announcement um, campaign. Uh, and it, I'm not a good Hollywood person, so uh, I'm sure my version of it isn't the best one. But I imagine a senior recognizable military figure who's walking through the airport in the, in the TV spot, and people are coming up to him and saying, thanks for your service, thanks for your service, or her, thanks for your service. And the person receives the thanks and then says, so what do you do? And the person says, oh, I teach middle school. Oh, thanks for your service. That's a hard job. Or, you know, I remove asbestos. Thanks for your service. That's a dangerous job, et cetera. That is, there's many, many ways you can serve the public good. Military service does is un distinctive, and we ask the military to do things that we don't ask other people to do to include the State Department. We send the military to places we don't send the State Department. So uh, it, that does deserve special recognition, but it's not the only thing that deserves recognition. And so it's a thanks for your service that's the military passes back to everybody else. Uh, and I think that would be off, that, that would be unsettling enough. <laughs> what do you mean thanks for my service? Oh, wait a second. Yeah, we all have a role to play in society. I, I think that would um, help in the ennobling uh, process. Those would be my two uh, practical recommendations. All right. Well, one, uh, in terms of the military side, this came up a little bit earlier, but enforce the regulations that we have and do so in a nonpartisan way to and then develop new regulations that ensure that the uh, sort of where people sort of are touting their military service as a basis for various kinds of cla political claims, right? That that is not a central feature. Um, and I want to sort of, I'm now finally look at maybe a little bit of a disagreement, right? That's always a good thing. Um, well, you're wrong. I'm in agreement. Right? <laughs> you are. All right. To push back against militarist myth-making. But, you know, what I fear that where Peter is suggesting produces the potential to trivialize conceptions of service. Yeah. But what we found was something really interesting, which I didn't mention earlier. I went into a lot of this research thinking that if we... Um, one reason that people are perhaps more casual desensitive than we otherwise might think, um, if you look at what's gone on in Europe, in the United States, amidst the war on terror, the war in Afghanistan, uh, I assume that maybe one reason for that is that we are constantly talking about military, uh, those who serve in the military, as paragons of patriotism and exemplary citizenship. And that that was essentially activating in us a sense of obligation, that they were die potentially dying on the battlefield. Well, lo and behold, when we conducted experiments, and we've now done this repeatedly in multiple countries, we discover exactly the opposite. That when we prime people to think about soldiering as a form, as a paragon, as people who are motivated primarily by intrinsic motives, patriotism and good citizenship, 
people are more likely to assume that they've consented, and therefore they are more supportive of military operations and less sensitive to their casualties. But if we emphasize that they are in fact doing a dangerous job that they have voluntarily done, ironically, people are less supportive because they assume they just did it for the pay and benefits and that they are not really doing it because they want to be deployed. That is, um, so Peter's solution, in other words, the, the pedestalization, the putting the props and so on, that is actually not good for our soldiers. It's not good for democracy, certainly, in terms of deference. It's not good for how we make decisions in foreign policy, but it's also not good for soldiers themselves because it actually primes people to be more supportive of military operations than they otherwise would be. So I'd be reluctant to go that route, and I'd rather talk instead about soldiering as dangerous work. Um, I guess I would, I would stick a little bit on my, we've heard a lot about diversity, so, so you know, I'm in some ways loath to, to perpetuate it, but when we think about rec the recruiting situation right now, um, some difficult, I mean, absent somebody tanking the economy for the purposes of you know, perpetuating the all-volunteer force, which I don't think is a viable policy option, um, <laughs> nor a desirable one, to be very clear. Um, I think some difficult decisions are going to be made about, you know, we all want to hear, well, standards won't be reduced. Well, standards will be altered in order to continue this in, in the short run. And what I would like to see is a, a really serious reckoning with what standards do what, right? Sort of what, what are the point of some of the standards and, and how do those correlate with the values of the, that the military holds dear and to ensure that the right standards are upheld and the, the standards that are maybe there as a vestige of past behavior are the ones that, um, that are eliminated. And, um, I, I would just think about, I guess I would leave you on the, that diversity tip of, you know, we may worry a lot about who's no longer interested in joining the military, but I want to think about who we might attract, um, who we might uh, propens to want to join when some of those values um, that the public holds dear align better with what the military chooses to uphold as values about equal treatment and fairness and justice. Great, yeah, um, at, at the Center for New American Security, we've been running a task force looking at the personnel mechanics of the all-volunteer force. And as part of that, referring back to the foundational document, which is the Gates Commission Report, I think it's fascinating to see that 50 years ago today, those same exact questions were being asked. Um, and we came up with a lot of set of solutions um, but it might be time for a rethinking of that. Um, so with that, we'd like to open it up for audience questions. Again, you can approach the microphone. Uh, remember to state your name, your affiliation, and uh, your question. All right. Good afternoon, uh, James Stewart. I'm a Bradley Fellow with the Army. Um, so uh, <laughs> Jammer's data shows 80% of those joining the military come from a family with a veteran family member. As mentioned earlier, this indicates the forming of a warrior caste within our society and multi-generational multi service in families. Heritage recommends doubling JRTC programs from 3,000 to 6,000 by 2031 to increase military and veteran touch points with recruiting aged individuals. The Army currently is pairing active duty divisions and corps uh, with recruitment brigades to do outreach to, re uh, to touch those same people. Um, are these feasible alternatives <laughs> to create lasting change or do any of you recommend other alternatives to mitigate the further establishment of the warrior caste in our society? So, Jumping on that? So, yeah, so I'm, I, there may be a difference of opinion here on the, the mm -hmm. panel. I want to keep the all-volunteer force. I don't agree with Admiral Mullen that the draft is the way to go. Uh, I don't want more casualty phobia, which is what I heard uh, Ron say so. I must have mis misheard him. The I don't want to make it harder to uh, deploy U.S. military to meet the national security needs of the country. The record of the times when it was really, really hard uh, to do that, like in the 1930s, didn't turn out so well. We were slow to the game, and the results were paid in blood of lots and lots of people who were forced to fight in under settings and with training and with equipment that was inadequate to 
the challenge. So I much prefer the professional military we have today to the military that we had in the draft era. And yet I'm as concerned as everybody else is that the military not lose its connection to the public uh, and that it re not merely be connected to the families of people who served in generations. So I do think that is worth addressing. You have the way to address that requires tolerating certain inefficiencies. That is, not merely recruiting in the recruiter's smile area where it's easy to recruit. Yes, still recruit there. Maybe Meredith and I disagree on that point, but I'd still go there because we we need to hit our numbers. But I'd also spend the money to recruit in harder to recruit lower propensed regions, and I would invest in in programs like JROTC if properly oversight. The oversight is important here, so uh, obviously it has to be carefully managed, but properly managed, I, I would do that. And also properly um, managed, I want ROTC on wide numbers of campuses and not just entirely on Texas A&M, you know, where you can get all of your, uh, not, there's nothing wrong with Texas A&M, but, um, and by the way, the recruits out of Texas A&M are not all that different from the ROTC recruits out of Duke. The folks who are in ROTC are probably pretty similar. What's different is the friend networks of the people at Duke are different from the friend networks of the ROTC students at uh, Texas A&M. And so the point is maintaining and increasing uh, connections and opportunities for, for connection, I think, is important. Two other observations. The, the polling does show that, re, that the effect uh, seems to be stronger on the influencers than on the, the um, person themselves. Absolutely. So the 18-year-old is not as affected by all of this atmospherics as are their parents and, and coaches and and counselors and stuff like that. And so where we are, what we have lost over the last five years, I think, is some of the receptivity amongst the influencers to recommend. That's the first observation. The second is, let's not under, uh, let's not forget that during the pandemic, we denied access to schools, to recruiters, and that that takes a long time. I think the effect of the lockdown and the is still working its way out. I know it's working its way out through my Duke students. Just the things that they, just the cultural changes that they've experienced, it's going to take three or four more years before it's fully worked through. I think the same is true for recruiting in high schools. And so this is, this is going to be a medium-term problem uh, that's going to have to be managed and and so I'd be throwing more money at it in, in the ways that you recommended. That was a long-winded answer. I'm sorry. All good. I, and, and I would say, too, one of the bigger challenges is that JROTC is fundamentally a civics education organization as opposed to ROTC, which is actually preparing for military service. And one of the complications, certainly, I think a lot of people in this room saw um, the, the New York Times expose on, on kind of this need for oversight in, in JROTC. Um, but one of the challenges is that that comes from federal dollars in school districts that don't have a lot of local dollars or state dollars. And so in some ways, we've outsourced civics education to these federal dollars that come through JROTC, as opposed to establishing the, the expertise that we need resident in the schools with our local and our state dollars, which is where some 80% of, of the dollars come from. So it's another interesting civ mill um, question is, are we, are we using um, the military and federal resources to cover gaps that actually need real fixes? Yes, we are. <laughs> and, and that's the American way, right? That's what we've done for the last uh, 30 right. years, yeah. Anyone else on that one? I would just say I actually agree with Peter entirely. Um, I would still, I mean, you still have to recruit, right? It's like you have to recruit where, where you know the more likely targets are. Um, but I think, new, I think new, the numbers suggest we have to find some new fields in which to recruit, and that will take a different strategy. And um, I also would, again, emphasize you're recruiting the 17 to 20-something, and you are not. Yes, the influencers matter, but 
the prime recruit might have a very different point of view about the world and what, um, how they, where they see themselves in it than a parent, an aunt, and an uncle. Go over here. Yes, hi. Uh, Jay Parker, I'm a professor at National Defense University and a retired officer and a couple of other affiliations. Um, first of all, thanks to the panel and to uh, uh, Dr. Urban for what's been a fascinating and sometimes profoundly depressing conference today. <laughs> um, I have a, a question that was triggered by something Ron said, but I'd like to hear response from, uh, from everyone. And it seems to follow on a, a theme that um, came up in some of the earlier panels. Ron, you mentioned something about uh, this idea of deference to civilian authority and how every school child knows and I got about that far before my brain said, I'm not so sure they do. Uh, I'm not so sure that many people responsible for civics education in middle schools, high schools, and even in core courses at universities do. Um, so I'm wondering if, uh, if any uh, of you are aware of, or anyone here, are aware of any studies that are being done about what actually is being taught in, um, in the education system about the, the foundational principles of civil military relations in a democracy um, and, uh, and what sorts of uh, implications that has for um, resolving all the issues that have been raised today. Well, we started. <laughs> Uh, the answer is I don't know, <laughs> except my own children's experience in you know high school in Minnesota. Um, but what I but what I do want to pick up on is one word that I used at the end when I talked about is lifelong civics education. Right? Civics education that takes place as a course in high school, and as we were talking about education in civil military relations for a cadet, right? When they have they have just sort of or in their ROTC course, that is a single limited experience, which is surely swiftly forgotten. Uh, and so what's really critical is how do we go about as a society building in lifelong civics education? The problem, I think, Jay, you're completely right. Everyone knows that slogan, of the people, by the people, for the people, but hasn't thought very deeply about what that means. Uh, as Risa Brooks mentioned in the very first session, that she sort of wasn't, why do we expect people to know very much about civil military relations? The answer is not a whole lot if they haven't thought of very much about what it means to be a democratic citizen. You don't have to think really hard, right, if you think about that basic principle to reason, I think, to the idea that our elected representatives should make the critical decisions because we have the capacity to hold them accountable, to throw the bums out, right? And that we don't want largely unaccountable military officers making critical decisions about those kinds of, making at the end of the day critical decisions about the, uses of for, about the use of force. But you have to have a society that is prepared to engage fundamental questions of civics, and I don't think that our society has been willing to do so. I, I, I want to add just one more thing. We've been talking throughout much of today's conversation so far about the United States almost in isolation. Mm. Our conversation that Peter and I have been having about trust in the military hasn't put the United States into cross-national conversation. And the same could be true with regard to this question. The US military, we talk about it as if the US military were very unique in being highly trusted. It isn't. In almost, in most countries around the world, the military is the, or very close to being, the most highly trusted institution. Even though a lot of the things that we might think that would contribute to high levels of trust aren't going on there. Would does probably drive it, what does seem to be associated with it is, right, all around the world, in the world's rich democracies, we've had the hollowing out of politics in general. We've had the replacement of contestation with governance, and, the res and we have had the paralysis of our political institutions. One effect of this, which has been widely reported in the literature, is essentially turning to the courts the judicialization of politics as a solution to problems of governance. But the other side of that, I would contend, and I have a paper that shows this, I think, pretty clearly, is where political institutions are less trusted, where they're perceived as more corrupt, trust in the military goes up. So let's put the US into cross-national conversation on all of this. Meredith. 
I'm not a political scientist. <laughs> I don't have. I don't. I don't know that well, I have, have more interesting things to say. <laughs> well, that that may be true. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, after you know, after that, what what can I say? Um, so, I, uh, Peter will have I, thoughts. I, yeah, I got a lot to say. The. Uh, <laughs> I I which is I'm wrong. Yeah, I do agree that we need to reboot <laughs> civics education in the United States and that that's in my talking points. I I believe that fervently. Although I also believe that when you're saying that uh, it's almost a banality. When I'm saying that it's almost a banality. And if I had 5 minutes with General Milley, I probably wouldn't say that because he has no levers to do that. I'm not sure that Congress has many levers to do that. That's a state by state locality issue. That's a that's a national conversation that has to happen. Um, and so yes, it needs to happen. And the few times that we've had a national conversation, it got hijacked in unhelpful ways, the 1619 conversation, which was really a, a debate about uh, civics education, but then it went um, sideways. That said, if I had a, if I had a, a wand that I could use to influence things, I might first want to restore the teaching of military and diplomatic history, particularly in the sort of seventh through twelfth grade. My students that I'm getting at that coming at Duke, and I'm sorry for the one or two that are in the room <laughs> here, uh, don't arrive with as much knowledge about. American military and diplomatic history as they need to understand the deeper issues of civil military relations, just understanding what it was like to actually fight in World War II or to fight in Vietnam or Korea or whatever. These are these will are lessons that previous generations kind of knew in the way that you know, we say that uh, was part of the warp and woof of being a, a, a citizen. I don't think it, they're taught uh, as well or effectively today, but are necessary if America is going to play a fruitful role in, in the world in our dangerous geopolitical environment. So I think a lot of myths would get um, exposed as myths if there was better teaching of that portion of our history of course, we need teaching of all history, but but particularly those would be my emphasis. I have one quick thing to say, Kate. Um, I don't think, I mean, I'm in sociology. I don't have the students coming to your classes, probably the same student body. I don't know that any of my students even know there's a term or a phrase called civil military relations, right? Um, which leads me back to the idea that I have a, I have a, I have a, a gut rumbling when I hear about the calls for civic education because it feels like it will immediately become a your civics education versus my civics education. Um, and and I, 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 I'm concerned that that solution perpetuates a bigger problem than it solves. I will say um, there's an organization called More in Common. Um, it's a nonprofit, and they have been doing a lot of survey research um, and looking at differences between perceptions of veterans and civilians. But they have been looking at kind of a parental satisfaction in curriculums that uh, their children uh, are being taught, of course, looking at some of the broader political um, um, breaks between uh, folks, but there might be some some good data there. Um, and then to the, the point of kind of a lifelong civics education, um, at lunch a couple of us were talking about how, you know, there's a lot of products of the professional military education system sitting in this room. There's a lot of folks who have taught there. Um, there is no civilian equivalent. And in fact, by the time you're offered the opportunity to really learn about the civil military relationship um, as a civilian, you're 14 to 16 years in. Um, and, um, and so there's some on the job training there, but there could be some more systematic um, training on the civilian side to raise at each echelon the, these issues uh, that will be really important for future governance. Thank you. Um, we'll go to our last question over here. Hi, Ed Putz here. I'm a Bradley Fellow like James um, here at the McCourt School of Public Policy. And my question is very micro. Um, it was spawned mostly off of what Dr. Krebs mentioned about um, pay and benefits and how that you know can be more of an attractor. And um, 
specifically with regards to like recruitment and retention dollars. Like we, um, for those who've analyzed the federal budget, they know different colors of money. You know, you can't move like just slash one budget, and move it all over to one side. So when it comes to balancing a budget of specifically like retention and recruitment, when it comes to propensity to serve, what do you see as an ideal balance potentially between should we throw our money more at retaining some of the good soldiers, good airmen, good sailors, good Marines, or should we throw our money a little bit more towards the side of let's recruit new people, bring in fresh blood, and you know, re-energize the whole system? I feel like that's really a question yeah. for Kate. <laughs> yeah, so I, I can jump on with, with two points. One, um, I think as time goes by, what we're actually seeing is the non-monetary incentives that really matter for retention. So for example, um, you know, the amount of money we're willing to throw at a fighter pilot to stay in is really high. One year it was $65,000 and people were still turning it down. And there was no follow on data collection asking, well, why aren't you taking it? Um, but in conversations and, and in, in interviews that I've had, you know, it was, my, my spouse was trying to maintain a career as well, um, or my kids in their seventh school and they're in sixth grade. Um, if I could stay at the same place, um, I would stay in, but because I can't. So what that tells me is that the, the sense of agency and where you stay is worth at least $65,000 and one cent to that person, right? So, so um, and, and a lot of the research that we've seen on retention incentives is that you end up paying retention incentives to people who are going to stay anyway. So it doesn't necessarily change the calculus. It, it changes it for, for some on the cusp. Um, I would also commend you to, to look at what the Marine Corps is doing right now. So the Marine Corps for most of its history has had a, a churn rate of, you know, 85% of um, their enlistees are one term. So there was not necessarily a retention model in place. And they've shifted that based on their operational requirements, um, looking at uh, expeditionary advanced basing operations, small teams, need a lot of leadership. You don't have a lot of leadership if all you have are you know, folks who get out at E3, E4. And so they're really being thoughtful about how they go about shifting from this recruitment churn model to a retention model. Um, but on the flip side, uh, I think uh, the, the assistant commandant just last week or a week two weeks ago said something along the lines of, well, we're not gonna offer recruitment <laughs> bonuses. Your bonus is that you get to call yourself yeah. a Marine. Um, and, and there's something to be said for what is it that we're selling. I think there's a lot of solutions that are actually require no money, might actually save money, right? Maybe we, we reduce the PCS churn, which, oh, by the way, is a product of history when a third of our force lived overseas and we had to make sure that they had an equitable opportunity to come back to the US, we might actually find that people choose to stay overseas or choose to stay at um, Fort Riley, Kansas, right? Which might not be someone else's uh, number one choice. So um, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, the other reality is that when we're competing for, say, STEM talent with the private sector, the military is never going to be able to pay the bonuses that the private sector is going to pay. So there's something else that is required to actually get them through the door and show them what the value of military service is. All right. Well, I think uh, we are one minute early for Heidi. <laughs> um, so I will hand it back over to Heidi. But thank you uh, to our panelists. I think that was a great overview of, of all the research that's out there. So thank you. <laughs>